Amaparna and on behalf of the Sarma Arts Foundation, I welcome you to Sarma Talks at Pandols. Sarma Arts Foundation is a not-for-profit organization that has a curated repository of art, artifacts and living traditions from the Indian subcontinent. It was founded in 2015 by Mr. Paul Abraham, a Mumbai-based banker, history enthusiast and arts patron. Sarma's mission is to make India's art, heritage and culture more accessible and inspire young learners to discover their cultural inheritance through a critical and compassionate lens. We work on a hybrid programming model, serving audiences both online and on the ground. In today's edition of Sarmaya Talks, our speakers will take us on a journey replete with tales of war, betrayal, bravery, loyalty, identity, and a struggle for independence. I would like to now introduce our first speaker for the evening. Mr. Arup Kumar Datta is an Indian author and freelance journalist based in Gohati, Assam. Among the 40 books penned by him is The Ahoms, a reimagined history, an imaginative de depiction of the Ahom dynasty, which ruled the Brahmaputra Valley for 600 years. Arubji. Uh, good evening, everyone. If I have journeyed a long way to be amongst you today, it is not without reason. Although I was born and brought up in Jorhat in Upper Assam, I spent my life from the mid-1950s to the early 1970s in Himachal and Delhi. The nickname I was given in school was Head Hunter. I, of course, don't need to explain to you as to why, but it was an apt comment on the reality that in those days, folks outside the Northeast had very little knowledge about that region. In my writing career spanning over half a century, I have been attempting to familiarize outside readers with the history and culture of that region. Thus, when the Sarmaya Arts Foundation invited me to speak, on an important facet of the history of Assam's Brahmaputra Valley, I jumped at the opportunity. I thank this unique foundation, particularly its founder, Mr. Paul Abrams, from the bottom of my heart for facilitating this address before such an august gathering. Now mind you, I belong to a generation that was totally alien from what is known as computer, let alone whatever developments came after that. So my presentation would be absolutely old school. That is, I have written things down and I will read it out from a prepared text. Now, I did try what is known as PowerPoint presentation a couple of times with very unfortunate results. So I hope you will not mind. I'll simply, you know, read from this. And I also discovered that if you don't give PowerPoint presentation but read from text, you can cram in much more information than simply going extempore, showing some tables or some photographs. Anyway, I do have a few photographs for you. Those I hopefully, I've been asked to click one of these buttons, they will appear. Uh, one of them has already come here. Now my mandate in this talk, titled as the Ahom Dynasty, Genesis, Continuity and Legacy is to offer you a broad glimpse into one of the most fascinating dynasties of medieval India. The Ahoms, who ruled the Brahmaputra Valley for 600 years, from the beginning of the 13th to the beginning of the 19th century. The progenitor of this dynasty 
was a Shan or Thai prince named Sukapa, which translate, translates as tiger from heaven. He belonged to the Mao tribe of the Shan people who dwelt in Mung Mao, a vast area stretching from Upper Myanmar to the Yunnan province of China. Mung Mao was not a single state, but consisted of a number of principalities governed by individual rulers. The principality called Maolung, where Sukafa was born, was ruled by King Pameo Klung. Sukafa's father, Tiawosang Yayo, had previously been the king of a principality of his own, but defeated by his enemies, had fled to Maolong. As Pemipling did not have any offspring, it was assumed that Sukafa would succeed him to the throne. However, at a late stage in his life, a child was born to the king, thereby destroying uh, Sukafa's hope. Advised by his grandmother that two tigers could not coexist in the same jungle, Sukafa, along with around 9,000 select Shan warriors, set out on an epical 13 year long journey to search for a place where he could establish a kingdom of his own. In 1228 CE, he and his band crossed the Patkai mountain ridge and entered the Brahmaputra Valley. After decades of meandering within the valley and attempting to settle down at various spots, the group finally established the Ahom Kingdom in Upper Assam in 1253, which is capital in Saraidoi, thereby creating the nucleus of what was to become a powerful empire. That you will see Saraido is in, a, in Upper Assam. As I have already stated, Sukafa's small group consisted of choice warriors of the Shan tribe whose fighting skills were unmatched. Their reputation of being Ohoma or peerless had preceded them and this is what the indigenous communities then living in the valley called them when they arrived. The Shans themselves could not pronounce the word sound ho, pronouncing it as ho instead, which meant that Ahoma became Ahoma when they said it. Thus, Sukapha's people came to be known as the Ahoms amongst the local people. It is also surmised that the term for the entire region, which till then had been called Pragjutishpur and later Kamarup, came to be called Assam in a similar derivation from their homes. Sometimes back, misinformed and perhaps mischievous elements had roused a hornet's nest in Assam by terming Sukafa's entry into the Brahmaputra Valley as a Chinese invasion. This was absolute nonsense. Sukafa had come not as an invader, but as a migrant in search of a congenial place where he could erect a small kingdom and govern it. By the time of their arrival, Hinduism had percolated from the Indian subcontinent and was the principal prevalent religion in the Brahmaputra Valley. Also by then, a common language, which today we term as Ohomya or Asmis, was evolving amongst the disparate tribes in the valley. The Ahoms were non-Hindus. They had a religion of their own with defined rituals practiced by their priests, as well as a language belonging to the Sino-Tibetan Thai group. They were a highly cultured people who had books on history, astrology, scriptures, political treatises, religious ethics, mythology, etc., written in the Thai language. Yet, starting with Sukafa, 
their enlightened kings gradually gave up their own language and religion to ad adopt those of their subjects, aware that this would create the empathy between the rulers and the ruled, so essential for the well-being and continuation of their dynasty. Moreover, there were very few women amongst the band Sukapa had brought. Thus, his men entered into marriage with women of the various tribes already living in the valley, thereby establishing marital and familial relations and enhancing the empathy. The Sukafa was no invader is reinforced by the fact that after he established the Ahom kingdom in Upper Assam in 1253, for almost 250 years, his successors were content to remain within the confines of the tiny kingdom. It was only after Suhungung ascended the throne in 1497 that the Ahoms first began their expansionism and gradually enlarged the empire to encompass the entire Brahmaputra Valley. From the time Sukafa entered Assam in 20, 1228 till this region was annexed by the British in 1826, for nearly six centuries, his descendants reigned in the Brahmaputra Valley. <coughs> During the course of the centuries, no less than 39 monarchs ascended the Ahom throne. First at the original capital, Saraidil, later at important ones like Gorgaon, and finally at Jorhat. Among the great rulers who follow Sukafa, we have Suhungung, 1497-1539. By his time, Brahminical Hinduism had penetrated into the royal household, and Hindu priests competed with the traditional Deodhai and Bailung Shan priests to influence Ahom royalty. One outcome was that the Ahom kings, apart from the Shan or Thai names, also took on Hindu names. Suhungung, whose Thai name translates as Tiger of a Famous Country, for instance, took on the additional name of Swarga Narayan, given to him by his Hindu priest advisors. Suhungmung's reign was also notable for the fact that it was the first time that the Ahoms left the confines of the kingdom erected by Sukafa and began a series of campaigns to subjugate major neighboring tribes such as the Chutias and the Kacharis, a process which, with the passage of time, culminated in the Ahom kingdom extending across the entire Brahmaputra Valley, from Sadia in the east to Gualpara in the west. Another important ruler was Susengfa, also known as Pratap Hingha, 1603 to 1641, whose reign was marked by great social reforms and the Asmis language was made the official language of the court along with the Thai language. Moreover, Susengfa was the first Ahom monarch to have direct confront confrontation with Mughal invaders. The Mughals, especially during the time of Aurangzeb, made a number of attempts to conquer Assam, and one of their generals, Mir Jumla, even succeeded in occupying for a while the Ahom capital at Gorgaon before eventually retreating. Till the time of Susengfa, the powerful coast kingdom, which lay to the west between the Ahom territory and the Mughal occupied Bengal, had acted as a buffer. But when the Kosh kingdom disintegrated, the Ahoms had to directly confront invading Mughal armies. This resulted in a series of stirring wars, which produced a number of warrior heroes, such as Lasit Borfukan, Otan Buragohai, and Bag Hazorika, who today form a part of the Asmis folklore. 
The Ahom Dynasty too is remarkable for producing a number of heroic women who through their bravery ace themselves indelibly on the collective psyche of the Asmis people. One of these was Mula Gavoru, who donned on a battle dress to avenge the killing of her husband on the battlefield and fought till her death. Another was Joymati Kordi, who endured abominable torture inflicted by a sadistic monarch to force her to reveal the hiding place of her husband, Prince Godadhar. Also, Queen Fulesuri, who was one of the few women to have been invested with the proxy responsibility of donning on a monarchical mantle because an astrologer had warned her husband against ascending the throne. Among the monarchs during whose rule there had been events of great significance was Sutamla or Zoidhaza Henga, 1648 to 1663, whose ill-fated attempt to wrest back Ahom territory from invading Mughals saw the temporary loss of his capital Gorgaon to the Mughal general Miryumla. Supengmung or Chakradhal's Hingha, 1663 to 1669, who selected Lasit Borfukan to fight the Mughals. Sunyatfa or Udayaditta Hingha, 1669 to 1673, whose reign finally saw the end of Mughal invasion with the famous Battle of Haraighat, 1671. However, for a decade after this battle, dark days descended upon the Ahom kingdom because of palace intrigues and infighting among the nobles till the advent of Supatva or Godadhar Hingha, 1681 to 1696, who brought about stability rebuilt the kingdom and pushed it on its way to renewed prosperity. Perhaps the greatest monarch among the Ahom rulers was Sukrungfa or Rudrahinga, 1696 to 1714, whose reign witnessed Asmi society attaining the zenith of prosperity and glory. During his period, under the supervision of a master mason named Ghanasyam Khanikar, brought from Urissa, not only was the new capital called Rangpur built, but also a fantastic array of palaces, water reservoirs, temples, stone bridges, sports pavilions, etc. were constructed. <coughs> he opened up the cloistered kingdom to outside influences, encouraged trade with the outside world, and tried to bring into Asmi's society all that was based from mainland India. During his reign, there was an economic, intellectual, and cultural efflorescence unmatched by any preceding period. Various causes ensured that the decades following the reign of Rudrahingo were ones who saw the gradual decay and decline of the Ahom kingdom. The biggest cause was that the palace gave up its religious tolerance and allowed Hindu priests to act against the followers of the great saint poet Mahapuru Hankardev, whose Ekaharan Namadharma religion had a huge followings among the subjects. The resultant conflicts saw a series of rebellions which were ruthlessly put down but continued to simmer, weakening Ahom authority in the realm. The final nails in the coffin were driven by palace intrigues and rivalries, with one senior Ahom official, Bodon Borfukon, going to Myanmar and poisoning the mind of the king there against his fellow countrymen. Sensing an opportunity to capture the Ahom kingdom, the Burmese king sent a huge army in 1816 
which easily overran the weakened Ahom defenses, forcing the monarch Chandrakanta Singha to flee to Guwahati and plead with the British for help. The victorious Burmese, called Mans in the Asmis language, perpetrated abominable atroc atrocities on the helpless Asmis population, marking what is indubitably the bleakest period of Assam's history. To cut a long story short, the British responded positively, the Anglo-Burmese war ensued, the Burmese were expelled from Assam, uh, were expelled, and Assam was annexed by the colonialists through the Yandabu Treaty of 1826. It is ironical that the Ahoms, who lost an entire kingdom, were not signatories to a treaty which caused that loss. The blurb in my book, The Ahoms, A, a Reimagined History, published by HarperCollins India, states that the 600 years of Ahom rule is replete with fascinating tales of war, bravery, brutality, love, loyalty, treachery, and treason. The brief and bland account of the Ahom dynasty given to me naturally cannot justify such an assertion. There are numerous exciting narratives in Ahom history, which I have not been able to mention, like that of Sorgadev Sudangpa, son of the seventh Ahom king, Tiawakhamti. His mother, the younger queen, was sentenced to be killed by a jealous elder queen, but was saved by the ministers and set adrift upon a raft on the river Luit or the Brahmaputra and given shelter in a Brahmin household, where she died after giving birth to a boy child. The Sudangfa grew up unaware of his royal lineage, and it was only after Teokhamti was assassinated by the nobles that his, survi his survival was discovered, and he was crowned as Sorgodo Sudangfa, the eighth Ahom monarch. As for treachery and treason, there indeed were umpteen instances of these. For example, the Ahom king Suhung Mung was assassinated by his son Sukleng Mung. The great statesman Atan Buragwai was arrested and exhibited by the traitor Laluk Borfukon. After the passing away of Sargadev Chakrasasa king in in 1670, there was a power struggle for the Ahom throne, and within the space of 11 years, no less than seven kings were enthroned and then murdered. In fact, Udayaditya Hinga, during whose reign the famous Battle of Horaighat was fought, was himself treacherously slain by a petty officer named Lesai Debera setting the prelude to a period of anarchy which ended only after Godadhar Hingo ascended the throne. There too were numerous examples of extreme brutality typical of the ethos of that age. The punishment awarded for crimes or savage, beheading after being given capital punishment was rife. A particularly brutal form of punishment was known as Hulabdia. When a criminal was thrown into a pit having sharply pointed bamboo spikes, where he lay impaled but alive for a number of days before dying. One of the most famous cases of brutality was the fate of the architect Dhanasyam Khanikar, who had been brought from outside to build some of the magnificent structures in the Ahom Kingdom. However, when the time arrived for him to return to his home, the highly efficient Ahom spy system caught him trying to smuggle out in his belongings accurate sketches and descriptions of Ahom defenses. 
details of army's resources, of, of the army's resources, etc., to, to be taken back to their enemies. After a summary trial, the Koniker was public, publicly decapitated. Naturally enough, the Ahom Chronicles have accounts of innumerable wars fought and instances of, instances of bravery and cowardice, of heroic patriotism, as well as betrayals. In fact, any narrative about this dynasty would be incomplete without highlighting at least one of these wars, the Battle of Horaighat, and its iconic protagonist, Lassit Borfogan, a master strategist, strategist who can be compared with great generals in, in any part of India. He employed every strategy in the book to stem the advance of a far more powerful Mughal army, erecting strong fortifications at carefully chosen spots, especially beside the Brahmaputra, which has always acted as a highway for invaders, asking his forces to show themselves to the enemy and then pretending to flee and enticing them towards well-fortified traps to be ambushed, using the evil reputation of the land to instill terror into the hearts of Mughal soldiers by enkindling their superstitious streak regarding magic and sorcery, and having soldiers dressed as skeletons dance near the Mughal camps at night. Not confronting the enemy on open ground, but adopting hit-and-run tactics taking advantage of the dark to launch night attacks, concealing war boats and troops at strategic places which could launch guerrilla attacks on the enemy from the flanks and the rear, undertaking marvels of engineering constructions like wooden stockades on the Brahmaputra that could withstand powerful currents. Few battles fought on the soil of medieval India could match the complex but successful strategy employed at Horaighat. It is a pity indeed that a magnificent leader of men like Lassit Borfogan, who can be compared to the iconic Chhatrapati Shivaji, are not known outside the Northeast and the great battle of Horaighat is ignored by Indian historians. Few dynasties in the world had enjoyed such a lengthy period of almost unbroken rule as the Ahoms. For instances, none of the world-famous Chinese dynasties, such as the Tang, Song, or Ming, lasted for more than three centuries. There were a number of factors ensuring this longevity, one of the most important being the establishment of a rigorous hierarchy of governance and strictly observing the tenets laid down by the shans or Thais since ancient times. The king, whose ancestor, according to the Ahum Buranjis or chronicles, were descendants of the gods who had come down from heaven and therefore was designated as a Sorgodeo or the Lord of Heaven, was the supreme authority. His orders had to be followed unquestioningly, any recalcitrance inviting the most severe punishment. Next in the hierarchy were the chief nobles, known as the Patramantris, comprising initially the Buragahai and the Borgohai, but later as the Ahom Kingdom expanded, and the number of subjects increased by the posts of the Bor Patragohai, the Bor Borua, and the Bor Fukon. The chief nobles had to carry out the orders of the king, advise him on various aspects of the administration, and in general, ensure that the state functions smoothly. Despite being subservient to the king, the Patramontes were invested with enormous powers themselves and could collectively depose the king. Though there were a few exceptions, this proved to be an effective deterrent 
to any Ahom monarch becoming a tyrant and acting arbitrarily. The chief nobles are also given the onerous responsibility of choosing a successor after the death, after death of any king. Below the patramantris, there was a successive hierarchy of nobles and officers, right down to the individuals who carried out lowly duties. Among the senior most officers were the Fukons, then the Boruas, twelve Raskwas, a number of Kotokis, Kakotis, and Dolois, as also Hazarikas, Hoikyas, and Boras. The systematic gradation of administrators, each enjoined to perform assigned duties religiously, no matter how insig insignificant these might be, was instrumental in keeping the wheels of governance running smoothly. How effective and disciplined such a systematic gradation pro proved is exemplified by another important factor which resulted in the longevity of the Ahom dynasty is adoption of the pike system. All the male subjects in the kingdom were called pikes, and instead of paying revenue to the state, had to render service as workers or soldiers in lieu of being given land. The pikes were organized into goats of three or four males. One member of each goat was of obliged to be present in rotation for such work as was required of him, and during his absence from home, the other members were expected to cultivate his land and keep his family supplied with food. In times of peace, it was the custom to employ the pikes on public works, and this is how the enormous tanks and the high embanked, embanked roads in Assam came into existence. The pikes were further arranged by khels, which were provided with a regular gradation of officers. Twenty pikes were commanded by a bora, one hundred by a hoikya, one thousand by a hazorika, three thousand by a raskwa, and six thousand by a fukon. The whole was under as rigid discipline as a regular army. The khels were distributed among the high nobles in the manner as described, and each official had a number of pikes assigned to him in lieu of pay. The pike system obviated the necessity of maintaining a huge expensive army, as the Ahoms had a militia which could be mobilized at short notice by the owner of a khel working through his subordinates. Some preliminary knowledge of his duties, civil and military, being implanted in each pike by his previous service in the state, he had to undergo a brushing up or a refresher course at his allotted headquarters or the metropolis, combined with the intensive training specially needed for the occasion. The state, therefore, did not have to resort to conscription as the services of the entire body of adults could be commanded in times of emergency. Moreover, the succession to the Ahom throne was not always a hereditary process. This was another seminal reason behind the longevity of the Ahom dynasty. While most other dynasties all over the world observe the principle of an immediate progeny inheriting the throne, thereby raising the possibility of a dynasty suddenly ending because of the lack of an heir. Succession amongst the Ahoms was more fluid because the division of the gradually enlarging royal family into hoids, with the son, wives, and other near relations of the reigning monarch being given estates which were generally known as males. The Saringya Mel, the Tipomya Mel, the Namrupia Mel, the Horu Mel, and the Mazu Mel were generally conferred on the sons, brothers, and nephews of the king, and the benefic beneficiaries held 
the title of Rosal. Thus, if the monarch died without leaving behind a male heir or any suitable successor amongst his immediate relatives, the chief nobles commanded the authority to look for a prince among the various fights and males and place him on the home throne, thereby ensuring that an individual who had the same royal blood as the progenitor Sukafa would inherit the throne and the con continuation of the Ahom dynasty could be maintained. <coughs> as far as the legacy behind the Ahom dynasty is concerned, there are numerous facets, but I'll di digress on just two of the important ones. Firstly, by bringing the Brahmaputra Valley under a single administration and providing a generally enlightened and stable rule, the Ahum rulers initialized a process of homogenization. It was therefore primarily due to the Ahum dynasty that the pre-colonial Asmis nation was born. To fully grasp this aspect, we had to understand the complex ethnological profile of the Brahmaputra Valley prior to the entry of Sukhafa. The ethnological history of the Northeast, of course, totally differs from that of the rest of India, since this region is closer and thus more affine to China, Myanmar, and Southeast Asia. Through millennia, there was a periodic inflow to this region of migrants from those countries. Although the Austroasiatics were the autochthon ethnic element in this region, it was actually the Mongoloids who had the origin near the headwaters of the Yangtze Kiang and Huangho rivers in West China and migrated in sporadic waves from around 2000 years ago who became the dominant racial element in the Northeast. The constant but periodic inflow initiated a process of conflict and dispersal till the settlers colonized the valleys and mountains in a mind-boggling number of communities contained within small kingdom of principalities, each possessing a distinct language and culture of its own. Indeed, the ethnic cultural mosaic that is Northeast India makes it a unique place in the world. In Nagaland, for instance, we have 17 distinct tribes. In Arunachal, 10 times that many more. This too is the case in Assam. While the hills have numerous ethnic groups, such as the Dimasas and the Karbis, the Brahmaputra Valley has over two dozen, including the Boros and their various subsects, the Kosaris, Lalungs, Hazongs, Koch Razvangfis, Missings, Boras, Devris, Morans, Chutias, et al. Indeed, uh, it required a strong central authority to ensure socio-cultural cohesion amongst this welter of ethnic groups and create a homogeneous entity. This occurred during the Ahom reign when there was a synthesis of the disparate ethnic groups inhabiting the Brahmaputra Valley and the strengthening of a distinct Asmir language culture and the nationalist Asmir identity. Greater political and cultural intercourse, intermarriage, and other social exchanges between tribes ultimately broke racial, racial and cultural barriers and imbued a solidarity and a nationalistic spirit to the people. Periodic, unrelenting assault from the West, which had to be repulsed, reinforced this Asmi's nationalism. The disparate tribes being also bonded, bonded together by the religious and cultural inayasa ushered in by Vaishnava saints such as Mahapuru Hongkardev. Moreover, apart from his role as a coagulant, what marks out the Ahom dynasty was the part it played in shaping the religious and cultural profile 
of Southeast Asia, the renowned Bengali scholar Padma Vibhushan Suniti Kumar Chatterjee, amongst others, pointed this out. I quote, quotation mark open, the most noteworthy military achievement of the Ahoms was their holding the Muslim expansion from North India through Bengal. There were persistent efforts on the part of the Muslim rulers of Bengal, Turkey, Pathan, and Indian Muslim, to conquer Assam all through, all through the centuries. And we have very detailed account of the campaigns of the Mughal generals in Assam. But these fights between Ahom ruling houses, between their Ahom and Boro and Hindu Asmis troops on the one hand, and the Bengalis, Turki and Pathan, and North Indian Muslims as well as Rasput and other Hindu troops under the Mughals on the other, show Assam in a particularly favorable light. Asmis kings stopped the Muslim flood from penetrating into Burma and beyond in a wave of aggressive warfare and conquest. Colonization, proselytization, and then conquest of Arab merchants and their religious teachers in Indonesia led to the final Islamization of Indonesia. The Arabs and later on Indian Muslim merchants from Western India found a direct line of access by sea to Malaya and Indonesia. But a, land route was aggress and, but a land route for aggressive advance was denied to the Indian Muslims by the Ahoms of Assam. Otherwise, the history of Burma and Indochina might have been different. Quotation marks closed. Suniti Kumar Chatterjee, The Place of Assam in the History and Civilization of India, 1970. We need to recognize that the Brahmaputra Valley was strategically located, with the river itself cutting as it did across the entire valley from east to west, becoming a highway for religious and cultural transference between the two ancient civilizations of India and China, as also between India and Southeast Asia. The key to this, of course, was the fact that the Ganges and the Brahmaputra met at a, joint, at a point now in Bangladesh. And this link had created a water route which since the primordial past provided direct access to the valley from the west. At the same time, at the eastern edge of the Brahmaputra, there were quite a few land routes to Myanmar, China and other regions of Southeast Asia, much used by traders, pilgrims, and proselytizers. For instance, one land extension of the Brahmaputra Ganges link was the Silk Route to China. From Hodia in the easternmost extremity of the Brahmaputra, this route traversed the Patkai Mountains to the banks of the Irrawaddy River, from where merchants going to Ava descended the river, while those going to the Yunnan province of China traveled upstream. Thus the Brahmaputra Valley formed a natural corridor across which expansionist Hin Brahminical Hinduism could travel to Myanmar and Southeast Asian regions. As early as the first century CE, it can be surmised that the Hindu king Homuda, who ruled Myanmar in 105 CE, had proceeded there through Assam, as also the Hindus who led the Shans in their conquest of the mouth of the Mekong in 280 CE. The valley therefore played a seminal role in carrying Hinduism and later Buddhism to regions of Southeast Asia. It was also the route through which Indian ideas and literature including the two epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, travel to those nations. In the process, Southeast Asia during ancient times was widely Hinduized. Aggressive propagation by Hindu proselytizers led to the erection of numerous Hindu kingdoms. 
the Champa civilization of Vietnam, Phunan in Cambodia, the Khmer Empire in Indochina, Langasuka, Ganganagara, and Old Keda in the, Malaysia, in the Malayan Peninsula, Sri Vijayan, Singhasari, and Majapahit kingdoms of Indonesia, etc. No doubt, Brahminical Hinduism was gradually supplanted by Buddhism between the 1st and 5th century AD and later by Islam in some regions of Southeast Asia in the 15th and Christianity in the early 16th. But vestiges of Hindu civilization remain in the form of magnificent relics or ingrained in customs and mores. Among the Hindu monuments still extant can be mentioned the Angkor Wat in Cambodia, the largest Hindu temple complex in the world, and a prominent group of temples in the Java island of Indonesia. Among the numerous Southeast Asian adaptation of the epics, we have the Ramayana of Indonesia, Laos, and Burma. Many Hindu gods continue to be worshipped today in Buddhist Burma and Thailand. Hindu figures like the Garuda have been adopted as icons in Indonesia. But the Ahoms, while facilitating Hindu expansionism in Southeast Asia, actually prevented Islamic influence from penetrating into Myanmar and further to other nations across the land route. With the land route blocked, proponent proponents of that religion had only a sea route in order to reach Southeast Asia, which explains why the Indonesian archipelago was the first region where, where Islam could get a toehold before spreading in the region. Though there are records of Muslim traders being present in Indonesian ports in the 10th and 12th century, it was only in the 13th century that notable conversion of indigenous Hindu population was affected. Marco Polo, who visited the archipelago towards the end of the 13th century, records the two small municipal principalities, oh, sorry, two small Muslim principalities existed in Aceh province in Sumatra. The 14th century saw the strengthened Muslim principalities begin a campaign against, begin a campaign against non-Muslim neighbors and finally supplant Hinduism and Buddhism in, in Indonesia. Islamic influence inexorably spread northwards to claim the Malaysia Peninsula and parts of southern Thailand. The creation of the Sultanate of Brunei led to parts of southern Philippines coming under Islamic influence. However, strong Buddhist presence stemmed the spread of Islam further. And it would, it, it would have, of course, been a different matter had the expansionist Islam been able to utilize the land route through the Brahmaputra Valley onto Myanmar and beyond. Therefore, what could have loomed as an aggressive conversion to Islam by the land route was terminated at the Brahmaputra Valley itself. There can be no doubt that the Ahoms are responsible for stemming Islam from flowing into Burma and beyond through conflict, conquest, colonization, and conversion. As Suniti Kumar Chatterjee pointed out, had they not done, had they not done so, the religious culture scenario in, Southeast, scenario in Southeast Asia might have been entirely different from what it is today. This is indubitably the most significant contribution of the Ahoms as far as Asia is concerned, an abiding factor in the legacy they left behind. Please allow me to conclude by reiterate, reiterating that the Ahom dynasty was one of the greatest political entities in medieval Asia, equal if not, equal if not greater than the more well-known counterparts in China or Japan. I doubt if I have been able to provide you all even a bare glimpse 
into this fascinating dynasty, but cherish the hope that this talk will motivate you into learning more about it. Once again, I express my gratitude to the Sarmaya Arts Foundation for providing me with this opportunity and my personal thanks to Oporna and Patricia and the others for their hospitality. I also thank you all for being such patient listeners. Thank you.